kneel before Zod. You can't go. All the plants are gonna die. I'm gonna take a bath. Bad dates. I'll alert the media. Boys, keep off the moors. It's evil. Don't touch it. The name's Pliskin. No more hangers. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in chronological order, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today we're discussing American Pop, released February 13th, 1981. It was written by Ronnie Kern, directed by Ralph Bakshi, produced by Bakshi and Martin Ransohoff, and released by Columbia Pictures. Ralph Bakshi's initial concept for the film was a feature-length animation of the history of the United States. He was persuaded by Columbia Pictures executives to focus instead on the music in America and signed an agreement to direct an animated film with at least 17 songs, budgeted at $5 million. Nowadays, you wouldn't have anything left for the music rights, but Bakshi had a reputation for his work in adult animation and was able to secure theatrical rights for under $1 million for all of these songs. Really? Yeah. It's very well, impressive. That That's amazing. I was sure that there was something up with this film because I was like, how did he do this? No, I mean, he actually like knew a lot of the musicians or was able to uh, be uh, on good terms with the, the families of mm-hmm. the deceased musicians and was able to negotiate really decent prices for this considering the budget of the film. That's amazing. At one point, the film somehow included more than 50 songs in a span of 100 minutes. Bakshi was insistent on the inclusion of Bob Dylan, Bob Seger, Bruce Springsteen, but was unable to come to an agreement with Springsteen's people. So I was going to say, I don't, remember. I don't remember the yeah. Springsteen in there, but honestly, there were so many songs in there. It was hard to keep track. Um, you know, I was trying to look them up while we were watching the film and the soundtrack li- listed online doesn't have them all listed but right. then they were all listed in the credits and it's just a, an impressive collection of music yeah it's basically like now that's what i call music negative 700 <laughs> it took 17 years to secure the rights to all the songs for the home video release in 1998 is when it eventually came out there was a backlash from audiences at the time who expected the film to cover the entire history of pop music and Bakshi regretted the misleading title But for him, it was always a story about characters and father-son relationships, pop standing in for both pop culture and pop, as in father. Oh, I didn't get that till just now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I feel like an idiot. (laughs) American Pop is Kanye West's favorite musical. What? And his music video for Heartless is a half-assed tribute to the film. (laughs) It's maybe the worst roto I've ever seen. And also the least directed music video maybe ever. Like it's literally just they filmed it in his apartment and it's just someone who doesn't know how to hold a camera pointing a camera vaguely at Kanye West and then they sent it off to Korea to get the cheapest possible roto. And it's a mess. Amazing. We open with rough character sketches and concept art, a McDonald's on the moon for some reason. The score is instrumental from Freebird, which was supposed to open and close the film, but they switched out the closing song before the film was released. We start picture with black and white footage and a title that reads Russia under the rule of the czars. We see a rabbi instructing children and we cut outside where Cossacks are racing through the streets. People are running away terrified. Someone shouts pogrom, which if you aren't aware basically means genocide, and we see Jewish children scrambling out of their religious classes. A woman shouts for her husband Yaakov to leave the school where he was teaching, but he refuses, claiming he must finish the prayer. His wife and son Zalmi leave town and we see a wide shot of the animated town engulfed in live-action flames. The Cossacks ride right into the temple and stab him to death with bayonets while his family leaves their home. We see them on a boat to America, and then in America, at a burlesque show, Zalmi watches from just outside the theater beside an organ grinder and his monkey. So I wonder does if uh, Bakshi has, like, Russian heritage, which led him to this? Because I feel like you could have started with any number of, you know... Ethnicity, yeah. Yeah, 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 like the the origin of, of music in the U.S. I mean, I don't think it's solely Russian, uh, so I just think it's interesting to to pick this particular route. Yeah, totally. I I honestly feel like this is a movie that would benefit from a remake that's told from a completely different perspective. Mm-hmm. Louis, another performer at the theater, is complaining about business troubles and ushers Zalmi inside the theater. Yeah, come here, come here. 
Wanna make a penny? Come here. A bouncer by the door tries to keep the kid out, but Louis assures the man that the kid won't look at the dancers. They pay him to rush around to each table in the theater with the lyrics to the songs that Louis intends to perform. Louis gives the kid an example of his spiel for each table, and the kid has it memorized after hearing it once. We get a montage of Louis, Leo, and Zalmi working the crowds at the burlesque show over time. Louis finally pays the kid the penny he owes him. On his way home, Zalmi buys two bananas off the organ grinder with his penny and gifts one to his mother. At another show, Zalmi is doing homework backstage when we cut to a fire breaking out at the building where his mother works. The doors are barricaded and the workers cannot escape. This is based on the real-life Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in 1911, one of the worst industrial disasters in the city's history. 146 garment workers were killed during the fire either by flames or the fall from the eighth story of the building. In the aftermath, legislation was written to make working conditions safer for garment workers. And to not barricade your workers in a room? Yeah, I don't even know why that <laughs> happened, but that it did. Just keep breathing deep. <laughs> you'll, you'll, take, you'll suck up all the oxygen from the fire. We fade from the fire to Zalmi saying goodbye to the body of his mother and leaving with Louis, who is apparently now his guardian. We fade forward in time to Zalmi performing a juvenile, which is a type of vaudeville show for young performers. On the sidelines, a stage manager tells Louis that the kid's voice is changing and that he's too old for this. Zalmi is drafted into the army in the theater corps. Louis and Zalmi are playing the front and back halves of a horse on stage with a dancer when an airstrike flies low overhead and shoots at the stage. Some of the footage they've rotoed over here is from actual like old war movies. Zalmi is shot through the costume and can be heard coughing up blood inside of it. Zalmi, what's wrong? We see Zalmi at the hospital recovering and Louis congratulates him on his voice finally changing. We cut to Zalmi on stage again in a clown outfit and his voice is really unpleasant and it's making the audience uncomfortable. You ain't laughing. Well, you ain't laughing because I ain't finished yet. You'll know when I'm finished, then you'll be laughing. If you ain't, then I'll be crying. That ought to be good for a few laughs. Either way, you win! As he crawls off stage, he sees a beautiful dancer waiting in the wings. He spies on her in her dressing room later, and she slams the door in his face. Zalmi tells Louis about the girl he just discovered, and Louis tells him to go for it. He returns to her dressing room, where the two of them lock eyes and slowly undress. We flash forward to Zalmi dancing with the girl, who we will learn is named Bella. He compliments her singing voice and promises to make her a star. Later he asks Louis for help getting Bella famous. And we flash forward again to a crowded speakeasy where Bella is preparing to perform and she is many months pregnant. People start to give Zalmi shit about not having proposed to this girl having his child. You want the kid or you want the girl fixed? We want the kid. Well then go get married. This is a wholesome place. No, I, I took these to be mob guys that are right. ragging on right. him. Yeah, okay. they're very family-oriented. Which apparently Louis was already either integrated with or... Has become so. Has become so. Yeah. yeah. Zalmi accepts money from a local mob boss named Palumbo to pay for the wedding. One night at the Club Bellissima, a rival gang breaks in during a performance and shoots the place up while Bella is singing on stage. Zalmi and his family survive but Palumbo declares war on the responsible gang, and we see them trade bullets in a montage of shootouts and stabbings. A lot of these murders are roto directly from 1931's The Public Enemy. That's interesting. Like, I wonder if he had to get rights to those movies as well. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because, I mean, I guess in 81, they they weren't in the public domain yet, right? They, they would have been, Public Enemy would have been about 50 or so years old. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, it's interesting because you're taking something and you're changing it, but... Mm -hmm. You're still taking it. I guess it, part of it also is that you have to recognize that that's where it came from. And maybe the people who are responsible for maintaining the rights don't recognize their own footage when it's sure. traced and colored in. In this bit, we also see a lot of spliced in crime scene photos from the actual era that the story takes place. Then we see Zalmi hosting a card game while Zalmi's son, Benny, plays the piano. Bella answers the door to accept a package, but before Zalmi can tell her to get away from it, it explodes in the entry hall, killing her. We flash forward on Benny's hands playing the piano, and he ages up and he's better at the piano. He's playing a jazz piano in a blues club now, and Zalmi tries to talk his son into taking his music work seriously and selling out to a major label. He also asks Benny to marry the daughter of the mob boss, Palumbo, and we cut right to the wedding of Benny and Palumbo's daughter. This movie moves very quickly, yeah. 
and then slows down and then moves quickly again. Well, yeah, it does. Yeah, and I was going to make the point that although you're you're kind of weaving this together like a, a, a quick narrative, it's really it's really more of an art piece because right. the, like so much of this just kind of sits there and is visuals and you're, you're watching a lot without a lot of dialogue happening. And you're, so you're sort of absorbing this narrative through the visuals with, without a lot of, I guess, you know, without, with, without a lot of story delivered to you through dialogue. Right. That's true. We see them return home to a palatial estate. What are the two of us supposed to do in this big house? Make three, four, or five. Is that what you want? If you do. Benny immediately signs up to join the army and fight in World War II. I guess he didn't. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. <laughs> it's like, uh... He at least made them three. Yeah. Zalmi's pretty upset that he would risk his life just as he's starting a new family. We get some swing music intercut with Benny at War. While clearing a dilapidated neighborhood, Benny finds an abandoned piano and sits to play As Time Goes By from Casablanca. I feel like this is a bad idea, even if there weren't a Nazi hiding in the room. Yeah. I feel like drawing attention to your location in during wartime in a, in a, in a city under attack is a bad plan. Yeah, uh, I get the impression he doesn't care and that he was just overcome by his desire to play the piano when he saw it. Yeah, I mean, I think that is the point because a lot of the point of this entire film is that generation after generation is they keep coming back is, to music. is just drawn to music so strongly that they cannot help it no matter what is in their way right a nazi appears from rubble behind him and when benny notices he switches to play lael anderson's lily marlene the nazi has an emotional reaction to the song but when it ends he shoots benny to death anyway danke We cut back to Benny's family in America. Benny's father, Zalmi, is on television during a trial involving the crimes of the Palumbo family. Palumbo urges Benny's son, Tony, to watch the trial to see how a real man acts under pressure. Much to Palumbo's surprise, Zalmi rolls over on him completely. Palumbo shouts at Louie for defending the kid. I can't believe it. That schmuck is going to sing! Sing? Sure. That's all he ever wanted. We cut forward in time to a beat poetry performance. It almost looks like the exact basement performance space from Heartbeat last yeah, year. I was totally. thinking that. <laughs> a poet is reading Allen Ginsberg's Howl to the crowd, and Tony's friend is begging him to translate because he can't follow poetry. Tony's friend abandons him, and we follow Tony to a nearby bus depot. Back at home, Tony argues with his much younger step-siblings about how much television they watch, but they tune out his rant. They know better than to listen to this nonsense. I'm talking to you! We're ignoring you, Tony. Mom said to ignore you. She said they're going to a phase. Tony takes some cash, his father's harmonica, and his mother's car, and runs away from home for good. We're on generation two at this point, or three? This is the third three. one. Yeah, this is well, the third technically generation. the fourth, if you count Yakov. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, yeah it just... You, you skip through them so quickly that it, it just seems like... Um, like I, I would lose track, and like while I was watching, I would be like, "How did we get here again?" Oh yeah, that was the son of this guy, who was the son of this guy. Well, I guess he is the third, including Yakov, because Yakov was the father in Russia, mm -hmm. and then his Zalmi. son was Zalmi, and then and his... Zalmi's son is is this kid Tony. Yeah. Okay. No, what well, Zalmi's son was Benny, right? Oh Benny, right, Benny died in the Benny war. Benny was the shortest story, so this is the fourth, the yeah. fourth generation, because there's five total. Okay. But the, yeah, the fourth generation, uh, or the third generation story, the Benny story is really short because it's literally just, hey, marry this girl. And then he marries her and then he dies. Yeah. And this is, this is the character, Tony, that we'll spend the most time with. Right. Because he's probably the generation that Ralph Bakshi came from. Yeah. So that he, makes sense. That makes sense that he would know <laughs> that, that era better. As he drives across the country, he collects hitchhikers until his car is full, including one man holding a trumpet dressed like a marching band. He stops for a moment in Kansas, and his passengers don't want to stop here. One of them owes alimony here, so he doesn't want to be here. Uh, he tells them that this is where he gets off and they can have the car. And then once they've all piled back into it, he announces, It's stolen! <laughs> and then everybody piles back out of the car. 
Tony walks to a diner down the road and starts hitting on a blonde waitress. Shira. Shira? <laughs> is, that is that her, her name? name? No, but it, she looks exactly like oh. Shira. But she's just credited she, as the blonde, I think. Yeah, yeah. She's but just like, like at a high pony and yeah. very, very blonde hair. And yeah. a big sword. <laughs> just walking around the diner swinging it at people. She invites him inside and offers him a dishwashing job if he can't afford food, and he accepts. After the diner closes up, he gets extremely flirty with her, but admits that he doesn't intend to stick around in Kansas. He's headed for California tomorrow. She takes his hand as though they should take advantage of their night together, and then we cut to Tony on a boxcar with a bunch of musician hobos. Tony winds up in San Francisco working another dishwashing gig. He has taken an extended break behind the kitchen, and his boss comes out to ask why he isn't working. I uh, thought you said you was a dishwasher. I'm a dishwasher. I am a dishwasher. My hands is permanently puckered. He quits the job right on the spot and announces his intention to move even further west than San Francisco and learn the accordion. His boss tells him he'll never make it in the music business because he can't play the guitar for shit. That's cause my hands is permanently puckered. <laughs> On his way home, Tony plays his dad's harmonica until some people on a balcony hear him and invite him up to jam with them. When they learn he's a songwriter, they tell him to run home and collect his songs for them to try out. On his way home, he's inspired and scribbles out the lyrics to Bob Dylan's Don't Think Twice, It's All Right. But just to be clear, uh, in this movie, they are yes. pretending that these these famous songs that we know as you know a Bob Dylan song were written by these fictional characters. Right, right. We cut right to them performing the song on stage, and it's going over well. As they grow in popularity, their access to drugs also grows, and we cut to them in a major concert. Tony is jamming just off stage, tripping on acid, and we intercut footage of the Vietnam War into the band performing Jefferson Airplane's Don't You Want Somebody to Love. The lead singer of the band, Frankie, drags Tony on stage. His trip gets really scary, and he's swatting a tambourine at the melting faces of the audience until he falls off the front of the stage. We cut to him in the hospital in a full-body cast. Their album is number one on the Billboard chart, so they used their advance for their next album to buy Tony an electric typewriter. We see Tony home from the hospital and addicted to pain pills. He calls everybody he knows, but nobody has anything for him. The band is doing really well without him, and he reads in the paper that Frankie, the lead singer, who he has been fairly flirty with, has married the band's drummer, Johnny. He's depressed about it, and we get a quick animated recreation of Balop's famous execution by gunshot in Saigon during the Tet Offensive. The last time we saw this execution referenced was in Stardust Memories, in which Woody Allen had Eddie Adams' Pulitzer Prize-winning photo as a wallpaper in his breakfast you, nook. You didn't ask. I would have I would have remembered. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I figured you remembered that. We cut from that to a studio recording of Up, Up, and Away by The Fifth Dimension, but performed by the band that we're following. Yeah, for the most part, they do covers, but there's a couple of places where they have the originals acted out right, yes. by the characters, So, but but a lot of them are covers. Another way to save money. Yeah, just buying the performance rights. For sure. Stuff. Tony comes to visit the recording, but the take is interrupted by the studio owner because Frankie is actively drinking instead of singing on the track. I mean it. Hey, what'd you stop for? I was doing great. <laughs> and Frankie, lay off that goddamn bottle. Hey! A couple band members notice Tony outside and give him shit for disappearing and leaving them songless. <laughs> They're the ones who disappeared on him. This made me so oh, mad. Oh, I don't think they did. I think he got addicted to pain pills and stopped returning their calls. Oh, see, I, I got the impression like that he was in the body cast and they took off, and when he came back to their place, it was like all empty. No, they literally bought him a gift to write songs for them Oh, okay. With. I misunderstood this. No, I, th I think he disappeared on them, and they, they're all mad at him. It seems like they're even blaming Frankie's behavior on Tony, like she wouldn't be drinking if he had stuck around. Well, it's your wife, man. Oh, get off. That only lasted two weeks, man. That chick's crazy. Where the hell you been? Finally, Frankie notices him and rushes out of the booth to shout at him. Jesus Christ, how could you do that to me? How could you do that? How could you do that, Christ? How could you do that? Don't you know I'm nothing without you? We cut right to them in bed together, sharing drugs and listening to Jimi Hendrix's Purple Haze. Now we see the band is backstage while Jimi plays, and they're waiting to go on. He's opening for them. A stage manager has to remind them what city they're in, Kansas City, and then he suddenly notices a kid that snuck backstage. How'd you get in here? Get out! Get out of here! Hey. 
Let the kid stay. When Tony finally looks at the kid, he immediately recognizes him as the son of the waitress who he had a one-night stand with. I feel like this was the part of the movie that bothered me the most. It's just so weirdly coincidental that his actual son would end up in the back of his show in Kansas City. I, I guess this gets into like the force, like of in the sense like that all, they're all their family by blood is drawn to the music industry. So here comes like this band through town. So just like Zalmi was out in front of the burlesque listening to the music wanting to get closer and here's this kid i actually think the kid knew the whole time that he was his dad you think so yeah i think that this band was big enough that his mom had seen the guy on tv and said that's your father Mm. yeah and so that's why he went to this concert that's why he snuck backstage and immediately he looks at him like a father figure like oh can you teach me to write songs i think that that makes sense i think that maybe while i was watching the film the first time i wasn't really tracking how big they were because it's it's a little confusing yeah. that they're using other popular music i'm like are you covering this is that your song quote but the unquote? fact that Jimi hendrix is opening for them exactly i mean that was that was the clue but for me i wasn't really tracking that they were that famous until that moment yeah Frankie offers to sing the kid a song, and tony heads outside to smoke and cry at the realization that he abandoned a son here in kansas Tony returns from his life-changing realization to find that Frankie has fatally overdosed on heroin. EMTs load her into an ambulance as he wails, and we cut back to New York. Tony has apparently kidnapped his own son and returned to New York City. We're we're just assuming that the mom is not around. Yeah, or at least that she condoned this maybe because it's like maybe it's maybe it's in everyone's interest for him to have a relationship with his father and she works a lot. I guess, but like... I don't know. I also thought this was weird because... I'm it seems like, like he just took him. <laughs> it does seem like he just took him, but it also seems like if you were the mom and you're like, hey, this guy's a famous rock star, I'd be like, maybe maybe mm. it's not a great place to put a kid. Yeah. His son tries to take care of him and keep him on the right track, but it's a constant fight. Tony hits the streets and sells drugs for money, while Pete tries to make a legitimate living playing guitar as a street performer. Tony leads his kid through dangerous situations, narrowly avoiding fights over turf, and neighborhoods with dead junkies collapsed in the streets. Somewhere along the line, little Pete gets some cool purple sunglasses and is instantly a badass. <laughs> there's some there's some really interesting shots through these montages. Um, you know, I think that they're they're interesting in part because of the the style of the the roto that we're seeing here yeah. for the animation, but also just you know, like you go like a you know low camera angle looking up, and because these are sort of like solid shading on these characters yeah your the force perspective the is force perspective looks a little you know funky and interesting so and i also liked when um i think it was during the hendrix song or maybe a, later in a different hendrix song that they did the fisheye lens for yeah. um the footage so it's like on top of the roto it just looks that much weirder tony and pete are sleeping on the docks and a mugger approaches them But without even blinking, Pete just pulls out a switchblade and flicks it open, and the guy moves along. We see Pete making small tips on the sidewalk, but his father keeps snagging all of his cash to buy more drugs with. Tony and Pete have one last argument. Tony wants to sell Pete's guitar at a pawn shop, and Pete doesn't want to give it up. Tony asks why Pete bothers to stay with him. You don't trust me? No. Then, Then why'd you stay with me? Why the hell do you think? Essentially admitting that he knows Tony is his father. Tony gives Pete Benny's harmonica and takes the guitar. I do feel like it's weird that they've been together for what looks like years now. And never acknowledged that. And they didn't acknowledge it before now. Yeah, That is weird. He promises to return to this exact bench and tells Pete to wait for him. Days later, a man walks up with a bundle of drugs under one arm and the pawn shop slip for the guitar. Did he tell you anything else? No. Yeah. He said to say, goodbye. We flash forward to adult Pete looking even cooler somehow than little (laughs) Pete. He deals drugs all over town through a full-length music video for the Sex Pistols Pretty Vacant. Yeah, he he full-on like Tobey Maguire's in Spider-Man 3 all around the town. But even cooler than (laughs) Tobey Maguire looked. Like the strut. (laughs) He even stops the jam at a... uh, uh, Oh, the the synagogue? synagogue, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the funny thing is he's supposed to look really cool, but to to my eyes, you know, this being 
40 years old, I'm mm. like, okay, he kind of just looks lame as he no, spins around. No, oh, I disagree. I think he looks 100% as cool today. Really? He's, he's just fully fresh, everything he's doing. <laughs> he's funky, funky fresh. Yeah. But this whole music video sequence ends with him walking into a recording session with a band, and he has a briefcase full of Coke. Pizza Man, we deliver! He makes them an ultimatum. If they listen to some of his music, they can buy his Coke. You can keep the songs, man. I will keep the Coke, too. This <laughs> <laughs> sounds like Mitch, Mitch Hedberg. Hedberg. Yeah. yeah, I love it. <laughs> Desperate for the drugs, they eventually give in and allow him to play a single song, which according to Ralph Bakshi was originally intended to be Leonard Skinner's Freebird, but the producers chose Bob Seger's Night Moves instead, though Freebird does play over the end credits. Pete kicks over the piano bench and stands up to play. Up in the booth, the producers don't care at first, but then they start recording the take, and then suddenly the booth is full of producers who are all blown away by the music, and we cut to Pete on a massive stage in an auditorium, I, I like the the caricature of the producers. Yeah, up, up in the up in the window, they look like Bill Plimpton characters. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. They're, there's some really interesting exaggerations done to some shots of this. It, it, it's it's artistic throughout because they're doing weird. You know, when they would just intercut actual footage, you know, pictures right. and film footage yeah. where you know, in 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 inside the animation. So like, this isn't done cohesively. It's very artistic. Yeah. There's a lot being lost in the translation of me telling the story. Yeah. Um, but much of this last song is actually just live action footage that's being played through a filter because they probably just barely ran out of money to animate the rest of it. Well, um, I don't know. I, I I feel like it was an artistic choice uh, through and through. Like they didn't, I don't I don't think they ran out of money. It just seems weird that it was just for the last song. Yeah, but they in the 20s, they put photos of actual photos of dead gangsters. Yeah, but so, that's different than like full seconds of animation. I don't know. I think it's a it's a choice that, you know, in, in that moment they did that and in right. this moment they did this. Maybe that's the case. It's just lucky for them then that the last six minutes of the movie was as cheap as it was. We get a lot of flashes of the previous four generations of his family wandering around in the in the soup of this music video and that's the end of our film. Yeah, I like the like the background of this music video too because or was that earlier? The music video for um, pretty vacant. Yeah, when he there's like, uh, there's just still drawings like like that of that, people and yeah. Well, they're very interesting drawings too. Of just yeah. like like this exaggerated face with like a safety pin through it and mm. just like fascinating imagery like that that they are putting rotoed people on top of. Yeah, it's it's all really cool looking and um, I feel like even though this came out in eighty one, it did a really good job of extrapolating what the 80s would look like in total like i feel like it really gets the 80s down like surprisingly sure. well considering they were probably animating this in 79 or 80 yeah i mean it, it definitely the 80s feel of it was definitely like um like a sex pistols vibe yeah but also the like 80s. the glasses that he's wearing and like er, like all of his clothes are really sharp and yeah and the the solid colors, colors yeah. uh mm -hmm. yeah for sure our director, Ralph Bakshi, he was an animator on the Deputy Dog Show back in the day. Uh, he was also the animation director on Halloween 3, Cannonball Run 2, and The Twisted Tales of Felix the Cat. He directed 25 episodes of the late 60s Spider-Man animated series. He also directed Fritz the Cat and Lord of the Rings in the late 70s. And he's the credited director for Cool World, but he has all but disowned that after extensive rewrites took away what he had envisioned for the film. I like it, though. I like yeah, cool, cool World. Cool World's a pretty strange movie to describe to people. Yeah, but I, I remember, I think the first time I saw it was on television, but I remember really, really liking that movie. Writer Ronnie Kern started his career with A Change of Seasons last year, mostly television after this, starting with a Baywatch episode. Producer Martin Ransahoff was the co-founder of Filmways Incorporated. He was the EP on the original Beverly Hillbillies, he was a producer for Fearless Vampire Killers, Ice Station Zebra, Catch-22, and A Change of Seasons last year. He also has a story credit on A Change of Seasons. Music was from Lee Holdridge. I'm assuming that's interstitial stuff between songs. Uh, he later scores Beastmaster, Mr. Mom, Splash, and Transylvania 65000. Editor David Ramirez. He edits Still Smoking in 83. And... 
Later, a lot of Star Trek episodes across Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Muse Small played Frankie, the lead singer of the band. She was Doreen in Fade to Black last year, the prostitute whose neck was impaled on a fence before Binford as Dracula made a blood feast of her. Now, I'm going to make an assumption that our actors here providing the voices, because I assume you're giving me yes. voice cast right now. Correct. But I would also assume that they are the physical actors that were filmed that and wrote That is correct also, okay. yes. She also played Candy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. She shows up in Man on the Moon, and she's Mrs. Springboro in Zapped. Jerry Holland played Louie. He was Bud Carmody in The Taking of Pelham 123. Lisa Jane Persky played Bella. She was Marianne Meacham, the sister, I think, in The Great Santini. Roz Kelly played Eva Tangway. She was Pinky Tuscadero on Happy Days, and we just had her as Diane Sullivan, the host of the call-in show in New Year's Evil. Frank DeCova played Crisco. He was Chief Wild Eagle on F Troop. Rick Singer played Benny. That's one of the generations of the story, uh, the short generation. He was a writer-producer on Suddenly Susan, American Dad, and The Healing Powers of Dude. <laughs> Have you heard I don't of know that last one. I know the other two. <laughs> it's a relatively new show, but it has uh, the only reason I know about it is because I follow Larissa Olenek on Instagram, and it's mm. a show that she's on right now with the guy from That Thing You Do is her husband, and it's about like a kid with a therapy dog or something like that. And the dog is named Dude. Elsa Raven played Hanel. She was Ida Strauss in Titanic. She's Mrs. Townsend in the Amityville Horror, but most people would recognize her. As the Clock Tower Lady from Back to the Future, she just passed away in November. We had her last year as Phil's wife in Fatso, and she'll be back later this year for The Postman Always Rings Twice and Paternity. Amy Levitt played Nancy. She's Maria in Dog Day Afternoon. Leonard Stone was Leo Stern. It's pretty close to his real name. Yeah. He was Charles in Soylent Green, and he's Mr. Beauregard in Willy Wonka. Do you recall the other Wonka parent that we've covered on the show? It's actually two. Yeah, it was uh, Violet's dad. Or not Violet's dad. Um, Veruca Salt's dad. Yes. Um, and that was in the uh, Night Hawk, Night Slayer. What was it called? Hawk Slayer. The Hawk the Slayer. Hawk the Slayer. <laughs> that was so fun watching that come together. <laughs> uh, we also had Mrs. TV, but that was much further back. I don't know if you recall that. Oh, God, yeah. Mike TV's mom. She accosts the host of the gong show as he's coming out of an elevator and parking mm. structure. Gotcha. Richard Mole played the beat poet. He's probably best known for playing Bull on Night Court, yeah. but for some reason the first thing I always think of is Big Ben from the first House movie. He's uh, one of William Katz's fellow Vietnam vets. He's also the voice of Harvey Dent on Batman the Animated Series and the voice of Emperor Spooge in Superman the Animated Series. Uh, he does a lot of voices. Uh, he's uh, got a great voice. It's super yeah. deep because he's so tall. Emperor what now? Spooge. Oh, God. <laughs> but but what I loved about him on the animated series is that because Harvey Dent on that show is a progression where he starts off as the DA. Right. Uh, and and then becomes Two-Face. Yeah, but like, Richard Mall, like Tim Burton wanted to do. Yeah, and so, but Richard Mall does vote both. He did, the, did him as Harvey Dent and as Two-Face. Yeah, that's great. Beatrice Cullen played the prostitute. Uh, she's Wonder Woman's friend Etta Candy on the Linda Carter series and Carhop Marsha Sims on Happy Days. Vincent Schiavelli was a theater owner. I recognized him right away yeah. when he starts talking. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like, even in animated form, you yeah. could just absolutely, the second he walked in, I was like, I know who that is. <laughs> he was in the Gong Show movie and The Return, which were covered last year in a regular episode and this year in a mini-sode. He'll be back later this year for Choo Choo and the Philly Flash. He's a Milos Foreman regular. Hillary Bean played showgirl number one. We had her last year as sexy student in Forbidden Zone and a Xanadu dancer in The Formula. Just kidding, Xanadu. <laughs> <laughs> Linda Weissmeyer played the blonde. She was Candy in Graydon Clark's Joysticks. She's June Knockers in Malibu Express. And she's Rhonda in Teen Wolf. Phil Sims played Vito in the Gong Show movie last year. Marcelo Krakow played Little Zalmi. Uh, he was Toby Anderson in Virus, a.k.a. Day of Resurrection, which I'll be reviewing as a mini-sode this year on Patreon. Barney Pell played Young Zalmi. So there's Little Zalmi and then Young Zalmi. Uh, young Zalmi was played by the first kid in Blood Beach that throws a fake dick at a cop. <laughs> <laughs> the, the kid that Chong did not adopt. Uh, Alicia Brevard played Showgirl number two. She's credited as Female Creature in the movie Bigfoot. 
and we saw her last year as the giant landlady mother in Man with Bogart's oh, face. Oh, I liked her. She was yeah, great. she's one of the one of the dancers here. Elia Baskin was All a tuba right. player. That's yeah. the one that was a hitchhiker um, that he left on the side of the road. It's like, I, does he? He probably has a line somewhere in the the crowded dialogue of that whole thing. But, but you can tell even that. Like after I had read it, I looked it up and I was like, oh yeah, that's totally Elia Baskin. Uh, he was in Raise the Titanic last year. He's back in 2010. A couple MacGyvers, a couple Spider-Mans. I'm hoping he makes an appearance in the next Spider-Man. We'll see. And, he, uh, and wasn't... Did he play in the... Yeah, because yeah, he was the landlord in Spider-Man. Right, yeah. yeah. Mr. Ditkovich. <laughs> they, um, man, it, that's what's so sad about Tim Burton's Batman and uh, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man is that they both got like aborted by the studios before they got to like fully realize things. Mm-hmm. But when you look at what he had planned, like allegedly what Sam Raimi had planned for the Spider-Man movies if he'd have been able to keep going it's ridiculous because Mr. Ditkovich was going to be Craven the Hunter oh. and Bruce Campbell was going to be Mysterio because he was pretending to be all these other people in his mm-hmm. previous cameos and obviously you had the the lizard in there so there's all these characters that were already woven into the story that made appearances in the films that were going to play villains later and they never got around to it it's sad Vance Colvig Jr. played Hobo Number 1 I'm assuming that's on the uh, box car. Uh, he is Clowny in Big Top Pee Wee, and he's the bum who saves the station in Weird Al Yankovic's UHF. You know, the guy who's like, change, mister. And then he gives them like a couple coins, and he's like, 95, 98, one dollar. And he gives the guy a dollar. Like, he just wanted to break a dollar. He didn't <laughs> want coins. Robert Beecher played hobo number two. He was Principal Stark in Smokey Bites the Dust for us later this year. Uh, he's also a referee in Barton Fink, and he's Ribs Mocha in Dick Tracy. Tony Fasci played Crapshooter Number One. He's Pickpocket Jones in Scanner Cop Two, which is the fifth installment of the Scanners series. <laughs> D.A. Young played Curtis. He's credited as a flatulence designer on South Park. <laughs> Lee Ving played a punk rocker. Yeah. <laughs> Lee Ving is the lead singer of the band Fear. And also appears in Clue as Mr. Body. That's right. <laughs> I always thought that in the credits of Clue that that was like a joke name. Because it's like, oh, he's out of here. <laughs> Spit Sticks played a punk rocker, also from Fear. Durf Scratch played a punk rocker, also from Fear. Philo Kramer, also from Fear. Chuck Mitchell played the doorkeeper. That's Porky from the Porky's movies. We had him as a pornographer in Don't Answer the Phone and the owner of a diner in The Hearse last year. But he's the one who was like, get that kid out of this club. And it looks like him. Jack Angel played Soldiers, uncredited. He was Ultra Magnus in the Transformers animated series. He was Nick Fury on the late 90s Spider-Man series. And he's also the voice of the shark in Toy Story. I'm Woody. Howdy, howdy, howdy. (laughs) Jodie Carlisle played Various. She's the voice of Dr. Sarah Bellum on Darkwing Duck. And Mariana Thornberry on the Wild Thornberries. Hmm. Don Hahn did the voice of Various. He's a popular animation producer who worked on Roger Rabbit, Nightmare Before Christmas, Lion King, The Emperor's New Groove. He also produced a great Disney doc called Waking Sleeping Beauty. And he's also one of the creators of the series Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius. David Hollander, uncredited, was the young boy with the coffee in Airplane last year. Does a voice in here somewhere. Ollie Johnson is credited as Various. He's one of the nine old men that worked on all the classic Disney releases. Doug Lee did the voice of announcers, Various. He's Indiana Jones in the video games Fate of Atlantis and Infernal yeah, Machine. Infernal Machine. I, I was like, I, I, know, I know who Doug Lee is. Yeah. I love his Indiana Jones voice. Uh, Helen Morgan was the singer in the Rated Nightclub. She sang this song. In this film, the song is Bill. Uh, she sang it in the movie Showboat in 1929, and then again in the 1936 remake. And I think they're they're tracing over that. The, the, those are the scenes that are getting rotoed. Uh, before the men come in to shoot the place up. Patrick Penny played Soldiers. He has Muppet credits in The Muppet Movie and Caper this year. Uh, He's also in Little Mermaid, Cool World, Aladdin. He's the voice of the pizza delivery guy in Toy Story. And he's also Cyclops in Hercules. Sherry Lynn, credited as Various. She's the voice of Galaxy on the original My Little Pony series. She's Marilyn Pickle on Bonkers. That's uh, yeah, the yeah. wife of, of Lucky Pickle. Fred Wayne is credited as Seven Rolls, and he's another of the Nine Old Men. So two of the Nine Old Men did voices in this. 
Uh, so there, I, I was I was poking around a little bit in the animation credits because I was like, oh, you know, we're we're getting to an era where I might actually, you know, know people or have worked with people. Sure. Um, and I did notice uh, an uncredited cred animation animator credit in here of John Kay, the Ren and Stimpy creator. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he was uncredited as an animator on here. Um, and then I was poking around a little bit more. And in the additional crew as production staff, I came across uh, Chris Danzo, who gave me my first animation job. Oh, is that true? So yeah, she was a producer at Toon Zone, and uh, she hired me there, and uh, cool. so we worked together. But she was also a producer on Ren and Stimpy with John Kay. So, so you basically worked on I this movie. I totally worked on it. No, not even close. Well, that's neat. <laughs> Were you um, born yet? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't born yet when this movie came out. But you uh, worked on it, though. And then uh, I also did notice in production staff a Roy P. Disney, who I'm going to guess is related to other famous Disney. Yeah, I'm going to guess he's somewhere on, he's he's on the, he's downstream from, from the From the, the Roy original Disney. Roy Disney. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because they, w- they went through all the letters, Roy A, Roy B, Roy yeah. C. He, had, he famously <laughs> had 26 sons. <laughs> um, I like this movie a lot. It's a big thumbs up from me. I think this is fun to watch. I like the music. The story's great. I like all of it. And the voice acting's really good. Um, one of the, or actually two generations are played by the same guy. I think it's Tony and Pete Yeah, are both the same guy, but it works fine. I think he's different enough in, as the two different characters. Um, but uh, overall, I, I really like it. And I, I would love to see more uh, more stories like this that are like multi-generational. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, I definitely give it a thumbs up. I don't know that it has a wide audience appeal because this is not the kind of thing that I think a lot of people will go out and see. Um, yeah, maybe. It's it's definitely more on the art house film side of things. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's less... It's got similarities, of course, to a Scanner Darkly type thing because you know we're we're rotoing everything, but it's 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 less of a narrative and more. Well, it obviously yeah. didn't do especially well, and Bakshi doesn't have a ton of credits moving forward from this as far as feature films go. But um, I really liked it, and I think uh, it is an experiment, but it's it's a very fun experiment. Yeah, I think I'm just saying like I'm going to give it a thumbs up, but I, I I don't know that I would recommend it to everyone. I'd recommend it to people who. I know like about animation. animation and yeah. stuff, but it's it's definitely not a film for everyone. Yeah. Richard. Uh I give it a thumbs up, but this movie really didn't do much for me. Yeah. Um I Because you don't know songs. Yeah, I don't <laughs> It's like, oh great, a movie about music. This is perfect for me. Uh and when it got to like like the third character that we're following i'm like okay fuck you movie like who who's this movie about <laughs> uh and then when it got to the fourth character I was like i'm so glad that this movie's almost over but because... pete was the best character he was so fun he, he was and i would have liked to have had a movie about him just the whole movie about <laughs> little pete I, don't know, I felt i felt good about the the string of following from person to person i didn't have any problem that it didn't have like a main character per se, I it, 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 I just wasn't interested in any any of the characters. I would honestly watch a continuous string of this going from the year zero to today. Like I would want to watch <laughs> like the, just what happened to this family over the course and of so all and these so years. So and so begat so and so. Yeah, <laughs> that's what it'd be called begat. Begat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think this is a wonderful film. I really enjoyed it. Um, Letterbox, do we know where this is going yet? Uh, I have it in fourth right now. It is below My Bloody Valentine and above The Incredible Shrinking Woman. So I have it on fourth, and I don't think it's going to stay super high because although I liked it, I it's probably not high in the list of movies that I'd watch again very sure. quickly. Um, Richard, what are you thinking? Uh, I have it at number eight. Um uh, which puts it uh, above Cabo Blanco, but below Fort Apache. Um, I actually have it in third, uh, so it's directly under my bloody Valentine and above the Incredible Shrinking Woman. Oh, that was the same as mine, but I but have. Do I have them flipped? No, you no? just I, you have one less movie above me. I have Scanners and Fear No Evil above. My oh, bloody yeah, Valentine. Fear No Evil's right under Shrinking Woman for me. Yeah. Um, I think that's everything for American Pop. 
If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. We also have a Discord now. You can find a button at the top of our .com and join the 24-7 movie chat and share your thoughts on episodes past, present, and future. Also, search for Vintage Video Podcast on YouTube and subscribe to our new channel there. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen which IMDb describes like so. Detective Charlie Chan helps SFPD solve the many bizarre murders. That, that's how the it's phrased? The many bizarre murders. Huh. His clumsy <laughs> grandson, Lee, who's getting married, helps him, helps is in quotes, is the dragon queen behind this. Solve the many murders. <laughs> the many murders. It's the, as the clunky many, the as many the movie murders. I am the itself. Bobolini of the many murders. <laughs> Perfect. We leave you now with the trailer for... Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen. Murderer forced victim to swallow 10,000 goldfish. First time fish stuffed man. <laughs> Announcing the triumphant return of the world's greatest detective in an all new comedy mystery, Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen. If you ask me, sweetheart, this is one case that will baffle even a great Charlie Chan. Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen, rated PG. Charlie Chan and the Curse of the Dragon Queen is now playing at a theater near you.